Hello, everybody. Good to see you. Oh, Arlene, you made it on. All right. Um, as you know, um, if you read any of my emails I sent out earlier and uh, many of you I text, uh, Brother Jim Baldwin went to be with the Lord at 222 early this morning. So um, he has received his his reward and um, is right now up on the streets of heaven finding out everything that he never knew. So that's that's an amazing thing. And uh, the Lord was merciful to him. So uh, we want to go ahead and pray. And then we want to get started and um, be able to experience what God is doing. Because we've got, we've got a lot of ground to cover. Um, let's pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the anointing that is on your word. Father, we want to especially thank you for the truth of the gospel that we believe. Father, and we've seen Brother Jim extend his way into the heavens and experience your goodness and your, your wholeness, Lord God, firsthand. Father, we thank you, Lord God, that the promises of Christ Jesus are yes and amen. And we just give you honor and praise for your word. Father, teach us tonight. Teach us out of your word. Give us revelation out of the Old Testament. Give us revelation about Jesus. Give us revelation about who we are in Christ. And Father, we thank you for every soul that joins us tonight. We're going to experience a, a lot of really good red meat tonight. And we thank you for it, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. We're going to be talking about Jesus in the Old Testament, and I want to start this lesson by just saying it all speaks of him, all of it, um, and, and I want to, want to really, we're, we're going to kind of go there and take a look at all these different things, um, because the, as we get into New Testament and thinking about New Testament, I'll talk about this in a little bit, um, we got to remember that there was nothing of New Testament. There, there was nothing when the church first started. For the first hundred years, they didn't have anything. In fact, it, there was no written manuscripts. There were letters that were passed around, but there wasn't any written manuscripts or anything that was collected and put together in, in a book that we would call like a New Testament. And until well, well after the disciples were gone, and after Paul was gone, after Peter was gone, after all those guys were gone, then they be began to collect the various letters from Paul, the various letters from Peter and John, and uh, the letter to Titus and, and uh, James, and the, the Gospels, the four Gospels. And there were many other Gospel accounts or good news accounts written by many other people, but they couldn't be collaborated to be proven 100% correct. Um, and people have argued and said, well, you know, if you've read any of those, you know, the, the lost gospels and this and that and the other thing, there are a lot of those books out there, and you can read them, but you'll find out that it, it's not just they, that they were not correct, because they're all New, New Testament books. Old Testament books, nobody's all that concerned about because the Hebrews kept very, very accurate records and the accurate records that they kept, um, they uh, they remained the same. They they copied them over and over and over again. They remained absolutely the same, and they made sure they hit they hit a, a a several step process to make sure that a copy of Isaiah, the first copy was the same as the one hundredth copy, which was the same as the one thousandth copy, and. They had checks and double checks to make sure that all of those were exactly right. Yeah, that's exactly right, Richard. In recent times, relatively recent times, considering we're talking about thousands of years here, but in, in the last hundred years, we found a lot of different things in the um, in the Sinai region and uh, the regions of Lebanon, Jordan, and that where, like the Dead Sea Scrolls that were dug up. Well, actually discovered in a cave, and they were uh, very much intact, more so than 
uh, almost everything else we had. And when they got to deciphering them, they were exact of what the, the scriptures were that we'd been reading from the King James uh, for a long time. So they, they know that the Hebrews had very, very good information, and it was all 100% accurate. Now, when we get to the New Testament, the New Testament is a little bit different in that it was, it was being written as it was happening. So John was writing his gospel as it was happening. Luke, his gospel, as it was happening. In fact, Luke was a, a doctor and a historian author. And, and so he kept uh, his journal of the things that he was investigating, much like a journalist today. Uh, he kept that in perfect order. And so we know Luke's, um, Luke's uh, account of what happened with Jesus, he got from firsthand eyewitnesses. And, and many think that he was a, a witness to many of the things that Jesus did. He was actually there. So the, um, and he was definitely there during the book of Acts. So we see those things, and we know them to be re uh, very relevant, very accurate, New Testament things. But then we've got Paul's letters, and we've got the other Gospels, like there's a Gospel of Mary and a Gospel of Peter and, and a bunch of other Gospels. But they what they don't collaborate with, and, and they don't match up with, and they don't uh, confirm, or they, weren't, they aren't confirmed by, is the Old Testament. So it is the Old Testament that is actually confirming all the books of the New Testament. A lot of people don't recognize that. They think we, you know, we we ginned up the Old Testament uh, by using the New Testament. It's the opposite. the The New Testament books were all confirmed to be accurate and to be appointed by God because they were they could be confirmed uh, word for word out of the Old Testament. So we want to get started with this. That, that's kind of just our starting point. In Luke 24, 44, and I'm using Luke, um, I could have used a couple other different passages, but I wanted to use this one because of, of Luke's accuracy. Because he, it was known, if you, if you read any um, biographies about Luke, Luke was, um, he did kind of the same process that reporters do today. Um, yeah, Richard, you are right. It, there, there really isn't an Old or a New Testament. It's just kind of all one big thing. Um, and and actually, if we wanted to divide it anyway, we have to go after the Gospels, and we, we would have to split it after John because the church age or the church history age doesn't really start until the book of Acts. Jesus is in the Old Testament. Everything he, he says and quotes is in the Old Testament. Um, so here we're going to take a look at Luke because Luke is writing historically as a reporter that's examined evidence, had firsthand accounts that he, he wrote down. It says, then he said to them, this is Jesus. They're on the Emmaus road here. He's talking to his disciples, uh, the ones that he found there. These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. So there's a couple of things here. When Jesus says, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, guess what? Jesus was teaching the disciples the Old Testament. He wasn't teaching them the New Testament, although what he was revealing out of the Old Testament what becomes the New Testament? It's the good news. Jesus is just teaching them the Old Testament. He's going to say, and he's saying, "Look, guys, this is what this means. This is this is who the Christ is. This is what redemption is. This is uh, what God intended by these verses. That's the reason why Jesus could teach, and he could say, "Listen, it, it's written in your law that um, if a man uh, has an affair with a woman, that's called adultery." He says, ah, wait a minute, uh, what God really meant, if you look at a woman and lust upon her with your heart, you, in other words, you, you sexually desire her, and you're fantasizing about it in your mind. He, he says, you've committed adultery already. 
in your heart. Well, that was a brand new teaching. That was an understanding they never got. And it's because Jesus was relating to them the Old Testament that they knew. All Jews knew the Old Testament, whether they were rich or poor. It was it governed every moment of their life. And, and so he's teaching them that. And, and so he goes on to say, yeah, that is exactly right, because they had ears to hear. Uh, but, they, but they didn't hear. <laughs> they, they didn't understand. Uh, because their eyes were blinded. In fact, the scriptures tell us, the New Testament tells us, that their hearts were were blinded. The God of this world has blinded their, their minds, their hearts, to understand. So here we see Jesus, he says, I spoke the Old Testament to you, and he said, I told you that the things that would have to be fulfilled were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. So it was written in, in all the different parts of the Hebrew scriptures. He says, I'm covering them all, and they're all concerning me. So this is one of the most telling verses in the New Testament regarding Jesus' role in the Old Testament. Every single verse written in the ancient scriptures will in some way relate back to Jesus. Now you say, yeah, but some of those weren't true words, like, like the stuff that... Um, Job's friends spoke. They spoke a lot of stuff, and it was just garbage. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't true. But when we take a look at everything that those guys spoke, and they, they were speaking to Job, and they were telling him stuff that wasn't true, all of that stuff still can relate back to the redemption story. So we, we want to, and it doesn't have to be true. People get that misunderstanding that some, some verse has to be true um, that somebody else spoke. There's a lot of verses written in the scriptures that somebody else spoke. God didn't speak them. The prophets didn't speak them. Jesus didn't speak them. But somebody else spoke them, and they're absolutely false. But it's recording what somebody else said in order to still draw you to the place of Christ's redemption. So... Let's take a look here. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. Now this is best read as just one continuous thought regarding the origin of all things. You don't, you don't want to break this up because oftentimes you know we go through because it says verse 1, verse 2, verse 3, we'll read, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Stop. He was in the beginning with God. Stop. And, and actually, there were no, uh, John wasn't writing this, putting verse 1, verse 2, verse 3. John was just writing it. And so this is all one big continuous thought. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. Here we see that the Word is God, yet the Word was God. Now, that is a really interesting play on words, because he says, in the beginning was the Word. So we established that, right? And the Word was with God. So, so we get a picture of the Father and the Son standing there. And the Word was God. Well, wait a minute. We thought the Word was with God. The Word is with God, but the Word is also God. So it isn't God and God Jr., or God and little God, or God the second. They, they, were, they, they are one. In the totality of their being, they are one. They are manifest as two different, two different people or two different beings. But they're not two different beings. They're one being. And, and I'll show you what I mean by that in just a minute. This is the, uh, the best way to, to really start out. Reading these verses from the original Aramaic version opens us up to our understanding to the true nature of Jesus. Now, this is from Aramaic. Trans, just translated over to the um, the literal meanings, so we're, we're not 
thinking about what somebody thinks a word means. We're actually talking about what the original word meant. Now, you have to understand um, what we mean by Aramaic. Aramaic is kind of a crossbreed language between Judaism and or between Hebrew and um, um, oh shoot, Arabic. And it's called Aramaic. It was a universal language spoken by just about everybody from that region. Then just about everybody also spoke Greek, or at least a lot of Greek, some Greek, enough to be able to communicate because Greek was the trading language. Greece was one of the largest trading uh, countries in the known world at the time. Most of the sailors were Greek. So if you wanted to trade, sell, buy, you, you had to have some knowledge of Greek. So Aramaic, though, was the common language, everyday language used by the people uh, that were in Jesus's time. The priest, however, used Hebrew. And now, this was a common practice. If you remember um, the years that Israel went into captivity in Babylon, well, they were in Babylon long enough so that all the people who knew Hebrew pretty much died out. And so the language died out because, you know, they were captured and take, drag, drug off to Babylon. In order to get along with their Babylonian captivities or captives, they had to learn bet the Babylonian language. And they had to speak in that. Now, they, they, they hung on to some of the Hebrew slang and that type of thing. But for the most part, when they got released to go back uh, to their homeland, um, the only people that really spoke any Hebrew were the priests. And so Aramaic, it, it was kind of a natural thing with all the people going, um, yeah, Ed, you're exactly right. The, the Babylonians forbid them. At first, they absolutely forbade them to speak. They, they had to speak Babylonian. Um, in, in a lot of cases, they cut their tongues out if they did. So the, the original word or the original language that so much of this is written in is Aramaic. So let's take a look here in Aramaic what the same set of verses says. In the origin, the word had been existing. And that word had been existing with God. And that word was himself God. This one himself was at the origin with God. Everything was in his hand, and without him, not even one thing existed of the things that existed. See, the word had already been existing before the origin of the earth. There's no mistake that the word is God in this. And, it, and then it tells us that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. In John 1.14, it, it tells us that the word became flesh. Well, we know who the word was that became flesh. It was Jesus. And, and so we have to know in our hearts that it's... Um, the Word is Jesus, and the Word is God. And so Jesus isn't a an aberration of God um, or a... Um, well, Ed, they did also have the Book of Enoch at the time, but it was not... The Book of Enoch was not highly... Um, it wasn't highly relied upon by the priest, and there was... There was a lot of things added to the original, the first part, because you know it's got first Enoch and second Enoch, so on and so forth. And and the first part of Enoch was, it, yeah, and it was kind of hid from the people. Um, I think because of some of the deep dark stuff that's in there, and and uh, because of some of the other stuff that was written, the, the priest didn't have that out, and and it uh, it wasn't widely used. The book of Josephus, Mike, tells us a whole lot about the language in, in um, the time, the history, and everything else. And it actually confirms all of this stuff. I mean, it confirms it boldly. Um, even There's even one account in Josephus ab about the man Jesus being crucified. So we, we know, we, we've got the historical data. And, and so that's why when we look at here, what John's saying in the original Aramaic, 
those people at the time, at the time that Jesus was on the earth, that the disciples were preaching, they had this understanding. In the origin, the word had had been existing. So in the origin of all things, the word had already been in existence. And that word being in existence was with God. And that word, that word was himself God. They already had that understanding. And that's why John talks about it, not just here in John 1, but also over in 1 John 1. He, he talks about the same thing. Now, in Exodus 3, 13 through 14, look what it says here. Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to your, to the children of Israel and say to them, this is Moses talking, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they say to me, what's his name? What shall I say to them? I mean, they're going to ask for his name. They're going to want, they're going to, want to know this name. Um, names had a lot of meaning. They were of utmost importance. And they still are in the scriptures. And every name means something significant, unlike we have today. So God says to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. So when people say, I mean, Mo Moses is asking a direct question. What is your name? What is your name? God responds back and says, I am who I am. That's like you ask me, what's my name? And I say, I am who I am. And you're going to go, okay, but what's your name? Now let's take a look here because this gets interesting. In the name lies hidden secrets about the person. It wasn't as it is today and that, you know, today a name yeah, basically, it's a label you put on somebody. People don't sit sit around. I mean, they sit around and think about cute names, names nobody else has. Is there a way I, you know, I like I like this name, you know, Clarence. Can I spell Clarence some other way um, so I can give it to my kid and he'll be unique, you know, and the only one with that spelling of Clarence. And and so you'll see somebody will write, you know, C L A I R I C E or something. And they'll come up with Claris or something, and and they'll they'll say, well, geez, that's different. It's unique. And then the kid has trouble always uh, the whole time he's in school because nobody can pronounce his name, and they don't know what it means. Unlike that, in Old Testament times, in in the times all the way up through when Jesus was there, a name had very special meaning, and there was something behind it. Oftentimes, they were prophetic as to what the person would be, would become. Uh, it's, it's very important we name our kids right, you know, because we, we're going to be calling them that. If you call your kid pain, guess what? Every time you call his name, every time somebody else calls his name, they're going to call him pain. In the scripture, names have power and reveal things unseen uh, in a simple cursory read of them. We're going to spend a good deal of time as we go on over the next uh, several weeks un uncovering really deep truths about Jesus through the Hebrew names of the Old Testament. When Moses asked God to reveal his name to him, it wasn't just so he had something to call him. People think that. People think that about Jesus. They think Jesus' his first name was Jesus and his last name was Christ. And, and they don't think about Jesus' name. It didn't even actually Jesus, it's Yeshua. Yeshua is the same as Joshua in the Old Testament. And so it, we're already talking about deliverance just in his name. And he was looking for the revelation that would be in God's name to prove God, to prove who God is. So when Moses is asking him that name, he wants to know what his name is because he's looking for the revelation in the name. So he can go down to his Hebrew brothers and sisters and say, hey, listen, I got revelation. This is something you've never heard before. And God comes back with this profound answer, I am who I am. Yeah, Ed, you're right. Just a little bit about Josephus. The Romans allowed Josephus to keep records. Um, he was a, a very well thought of historian, still is actually. Um, 
and and he let them measure. Yeah, the Romans did. They they, uh, they let him measure all kinds of stuff, which was would have been unheard of. Kind of like divulging secrets here. Now, that um, I am, that I am. Here is the word. You see it at the uh, top left hand corner, right? It's ute. Uh, pardon me. It's hey, ute hey. That little thing kind of looks like an N. Um, it looks a little different if you go back to some, I've got a better font, but it, I couldn't get it to come out in this program. Um, it it kind of looks like a window, okay? Uh, the little line, downward line, is supposed to represent like a fist, like this, working, a working fist. You know, you, you got your forearm that's muscular and you're holding on to something, a closed hand. Um, it's he yud he in the Hebrew letters. He is the fifth letter of the Hebrew al- alphabet. It's not alphabet. It's alphabet, and means revelation or to reveal. As a window, it's a picture of a window through a wall. You know, if if you um, had something on the other side of a wall that you built at your house, and you wanted to see what was on that other side of that wall, you would punch a hole in it. We call that a window these days. You know, you put glass in it. And and then you can see what is clearly on the other side, whether it's desert or trees or, you know, there's critters running around out there, whatever. It, it gives you a revelation or a revealing of what's on the other side of something you cannot see through. One can see what's on the other side of a wall by looking through the window. And that's that's the idea of the hay. Now, the number five, it's the hay is the fifth letter of the Hebrew alphabet. The, the number five in Hebrew is the number of grace. So he can mean revelation or grace. And if you think about it, um, revelation, if you, if you have knowledge of something, if you can see through something, if, if there's something that's blinding you or something is keeping you from knowing what's on the other side, and you can see through to see what's over there, then um, whoever you're communicating to, if you can see something that they're wanting to see or that they uh, they desire you to see, and you couldn't see it before because there's something in your way, but you punch a hole in the wall there and you and you look at it and you, you see the same thing that they see and you go, oh, wow, now I see it. You're going to have favor with them, grace, because now you're seeing the same thing they see. You're understanding the same thing they understand. I think that was really God's intent with the tree of life in the garden. Uh, I don't. He, God wasn't intending, as the devil told him, "Hey, you eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you're gonna know stuff just like God. You'll be like Him." That wasn't what God was picturing for them to find out. God was really picturing for them to find out what was in the tree of life. That they could live forever so that they could understand how to live forever like him. How they could be eternal beings in fellowship with him. That's really what he intended. He wanted them to have revelation of that. He, he wanted them to understand it, which would give them favor. Because now they were thinking like him. You, know, you know, get my picture as far as the hay goes? Now, the ute is a picture of an arm working. Thus meaning work or works. So God says his name is revelation works grace that because he says i am that i am the that is the hebrew word asher meaning who which or that etc and so he says when moses says what's your name he says uh, revelation works grace that grace works revelation you see that so, so here God is saying, hey, you're going to, you want to know who I am? Get a revelation. Look and see who I am. That's going to work because as you do that, you're going to fall in love with me. You're going to love me and I'm going to give you grace. When you have grace, that grace is going to open up more revelation. So when Moses asked God, who are you? God says, 
I am everything you want to be revealed about life and godliness, which is what we find over in, in, in uh, Peter, First Peter. God has given everything to Moses that is revelation for him to have favor. And the more favor he has with God, the more revelation will be exposed to him. And we find this absolutely true because Moses doesn't just get an understanding of the creation in the book of Genesis, but he, but he has an accurate uh, historical account of everybody up through his great-great-grandfather. So, so we've got this accurate account all the way up to Joseph going into, into Egypt. And all the revelation in between with all the types and shadows that are Christ, all the redemption that's revealed, it's all right there. Now, the Hebrews have translated these words to mean to exist or to be. It is literally the one who exists that he exists. The one who is. That he is. He just is. Well, to have that revelation that God has always been, that Christ is in God, God is in Christ, and they have always been, and that through him, by him, and for him, everything has been created, is created, that all produces grace with God. It all produces favor with God. To have rev re revelation that produces grace is to exist. Think about that for us. For us to have revelation about who God is, that produces grace in us. We, we begin to understand that God is grace. That, that actually brings favor on our life. And we, we do more than just breathe then. We begin to actually exist. This word exist is, uh, I mean, it's really a prolific word that means you're not just breathing. You know, you're not just sucking in air. You are, you are experiencing life. You are impacting the earth. You are impacting the surroundings around you. You are doing what everybody ought to do and everybody ho would hope that their life would do. You are impacting those around you. You are making a, a conscious existence here on the earth. So when he says, we exist, that we exist. I mean, he's talking about something. He's not just talking about you're, you're just here. Now, yeah, Dad, exactly. God is everything good in life. He absolutely is. So to acknowledge to, uh, the acknowledgement of God being, the acknowledgement of God being produces grace towards the believer. When Abraham looked to the stars to know who was there, and this is, think about this. When Abraham goes out, he's tried all the other idols. He still can't get a baby. He goes out. He looks up to the heavens. He sees the stars of the heavens. Who are you? Reveal yourself to me. That's all, that's all Abraham's looking for. Abraham's heart is pounding. He's wanting to know. The, uh, the, the idols couldn't have produced this. The idols couldn't have made this. Where, who, who is making this? Who is the, the God that is creating all this? God reveals himself to him. When Abraham looked at the stars to know who was there that was bigger than all the earthly gods, God reveals himself to Abraham. So, so you see how that works? Our acknowledgement of God being who he is, produces God's favor for us. And in turn, God reveals himself. Abraham's acceptance of this revelation gave him divine favor with God, like nobody else in that day. And, and maybe like nobody else up until Jesus. I mean, Abraham was, I mean, he was a friend of God. I mean, that's how God talks about him. This is my friend. And, and even when Abraham messes up, God blesses him, causes others to bless him. When Abraham's at fault, man, I'd like to live that way every day, right? Jesus is the one who walked between the pieces of the sacrifice that God used to make a covenant with Abraham. Remember, Abraham um, was kind of, you know, he, he's kind of wavering a little bit. 
not much, but he, but he's saying, God, you know, you you lead me all this way, and 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 I'm believing you. I know you're going to give me this this promised child. Um, man, just just help me out here. And and God says, Abraham, look up in the heavens. How many stars you see? Oh, can't count them all. It's how your children are going to be. Look at look at the sand on your underneath your feet. How many grains of sand are there? Can't count them. Okay, that's how many. That's how big your family is going to be. Your your seed's going to be that big. It's going to be that plenteous. And he and he actually shows him two different in the, in that the sand and the in the stars. He actually shows him two different families: the one through Ishmael, you know Hagar and Ishmael, and and the one through Isaac. Now Abraham's acceptance of this revelation gives him divine favor with God, and when Jesus walks through, he's got this favor. It's Jesus because it says they put a deep sleep. God puts a deep sleep on Abraham. God doesn't come down and walk amongst those pieces. God, the, the being God, the being God, Jesus, comes down and walks. It says he walks between the pieces. That's how a covenant was made. And, and that's what he does while Abraham's unconscious. So Abraham can't have anything to do. He can't mess up the covenant. He can't break the covenant. Only God can break the covenant. Here once again, we, we start to be we begin to see it, a type and shadow of Christ. We actually see a a pre-incarnate uh, picture of Jesus. He coming down to make a covenant, which is exactly what he did when he said, Take and eat of this bread, drink of this cup. This is a new and everlasting covenant that I make with you. It it's the same thing. He was making a new and everlasting covenant with Abraham because he tells Abraham, Your your seed is going to inherit this land and they're going to have it forever. Now, at the arrest of Jesus, as recorded in John 8, we find this. They answered him. They're coming. Um, Jesus says, who are you looking for? They answer him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus says to them, I am he. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with them. Now, when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Now these are Hebrew soldiers coming after Jesus. These aren't, um, and and they're they're around. You know, they're soldiers of the priests, so they they understand Hebrew. Jesus responds to them in Hebrew. Now, in in my New King James and also in the Old King James that I have, um, the he is in italics. What Jesus actually says is "Haya, Haya." He says, "I am." There's so much power in him saying, I am, that they draw backward and fall to the ground. Now, Jesus here proclaims clearly in the Hebrew language the same identification that he does in the burning bush with Moses. See how the Old Testament is revealing the New Testament, showing us the New Testament? Jesus says, I am in Hebrew. They fall down. He God Moses says to God, Who are you? I am. Moses is on his face before God. Why? Because God is. All occurrences of God meeting with men in the Old Testament are actually appearances of Jesus. Every single time that there is an appearance of God speaking or showing himself to men in the Old Testament, they are all occurrences of Jesus coming down to meet with men. None of them are God, you know, the, the being, uh, the Father, coming down. They are, they are all appearances of Jesus. And, and he comes and he meets with men in ways that they can identify with him. There are accounts of, of angels coming and meeting, but in those cases, it, it says it was an angel. And it doesn't say it was uh, a man necessarily. It says it was an angel. The account, and we're going to hit this, I think, um, maybe next week or the next week. When um, God comes, Jesus comes, along with two angels, right before he destroys Sodom and Gomorrah. And he comes to Abraham. Abraham sees three men, right? He sees three men. He calls one of them Lord. The other two... Stand up. They, they don't sit down with Abraham. They stand up off to the side. 
uh, they probably had their hands on their swords or something, you know. But but clearly, he he addresses them all and says, "Hey, let let me get you some, you guys some food here." But there's only one that he calls Lord, and only one speaks with him. So that's just one way. We'll we'll, we'll hit that one uh, as we go along, because that's a really interesting, neat set of scriptures there. In uh, John 10, 29 through 31, we see, My Father who, is, who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hands. He's talking about his disciples. I, and then he says this, I and my Father are one. Look at the reaction of the Jews. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Here in John 10, Jesus inflames the Jews so much so they, they want to kill him. Because he's committing blasphemy. He is a man saying that he is one with the Father. And, and he's they're understanding who the Father is. They're understanding the Father to be Yahweh, the yud heh vav the, the Hayah. That's who they're understanding the Father to be. And not recognizing that the Father and Jesus are one. And not understanding that Messiah of necessity, Messiah is one with the Father who comes down to become man and, and is a conquering king. They, 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 they're not getting it. They read it, they know it, but they don't get it. So this is just a major abomination to them that any man would claim to be one with the Father. Now, throughout the Old Testament scriptures, we find names giving us hints as to the identity of Jesus, and they lay out a plan of God for re man's redemption from sin. Now, I showed this at church, oh, I don't know, three weeks ago, four weeks ago, but it bears going back through because it takes you back to how deep this is as we, as we begin to study finding Jesus in the Old Testament and, and looking for him, looking for his types and shadows, looking for the signs of his redemption, how he's going to do it, because so much is revealed that will make our salvation and our Christianity so much deeper. The genealogy of Noah, Adam, whose name means man, begat Seth. Seth's name means appointed. He begat Enosh, whose name means mortal or frail. Enosh begat Kenan. Kenan's name means sorrow. Kenan begot Mahalalel. Mahalalel means blessed God. Mahalalel begat Jared. Jared's name, um, there, it's just Jared in, in the, um, is a noun, but there's a verb meaning for the name Jared, and it means shall come down. That's what it means. And if you look at Jared's birth, shall come down. Jared begat Enoch. Enoch means teaching. Enoch begat Methuselah. Methuselah means his death shall bring. Now, Methuselah begat Lamech. Lamech's name means despairing. Lamech begot Noah. Noah's name means to bring relief or comfort. Now, if you take the meanings of all their names, this is what it spells out. Man appointed mortal sorrow. The blessed God shall come down teaching that his death shall bring the despairing rest or comfort. I'm telling you, it's amazing. This is the first guys from Adam to Noah. The first guys in that lineage leading up to Noah, that, that, this is what their names spell out. Now, I wish I had discovered that, but I, I didn't. It, it, a Bible teacher, really good Bible teacher by the name of Chuck Missler, um, put this together. He's, uh, he's uh, deep in the Hebrew words, and, and um, it, it was great revelation for him. What's amazing... Um, yeah, Enoch was the Lord's scribe. Yeah, that, that's kind of what um, we get out of some of the uh, 
rabbinical teachings is that Enoch was the Lord's scribe, but he walked with God. I mean, it wasn't just that he was taking notes. He walked with God um, and was righteous, totally righteous, and never died. That's why some believe that Enoch will be one of those that comes down, um, Enoch and Elijah, and are the prophets of the book of Revelation, because they never died. And it's appointed unto men but once to die. And, and they never died. So uh, from the very beginning, the plan of God was laid out. And it was clearly exposed in the names of the lineage of Noah. He had the two witnesses. Um, it isn't just in names, as is, is we'll discover. It's also in the types and the shadows throughout the Old Testament. that we're going to find Jesus in the plan of redemption through his shed blood. It's, it's all the way through, from beginning to end of the Old Testament. Take a look here at Luke 24, 24 through 27. It says, And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb, and found it just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. Now this is on the Emmaus road, and Jesus is talking to his disciples. Then he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart, to believe in all that the prophets had spoken. Ought not the Christ who have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So what was Jesus teaching? Was Jesus teaching Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the book of Acts, the book of Romans, the book of, you know, first and second Corinthians, and all the way back to the book of Revelation? No, Jesus wasn't teaching any of that. Jesus expounded to them out of the Old Testament all the things, out of all the prophets and all the Old Testament scriptures and all the, the law of Moses, Jesus expounds to them how those scriptures talk about him. Man, that's something we need to do in today's church. Now, we need to remember that before there was a New Testament, there was only the Old Testament. The disciples were writing the New Testament as they went along. It took, some say, roughly 100 years from the birth of, of Jesus. And, and that's probably fairly accurate, right around 100 years of writing. So for 100 years, the church exists, and they're passing around letters to each other. They're, they're maybe recording some of the things that people preached and passing it around to each other, but, but they don't have anything but the Old Testament to go on. So their, their testimonies are based on the Scriptures. We're, we're just taught... Um, were just as Jesus taught them on the Emmaus Road. The disciples didn't have anything else. So it makes sense that we as New Testament believers, we've got to find out what's in the Old Testament. We've got to find out what's there. We've got to take a look and discover and read as much in the Old Testament as we do in the New Testament. And have our eyes clearly wide open. Ask the Lord to reveal things to us. And then beginning at Moses and the prophets, they had all... They had to teach all things concerning him. Paul was a Hebrew scripture scholar, and he could not see Jesus in the scriptures he was reading. Now, that's completely confounding until the Holy Spirit opened his eyes. And I don't know why we, we are reluctant or we, we don't take a look. Um, I, I, I don't understand why we don't. Just pray and believe for, for the Holy Spirit to reveal things to us. It's what the Holy Spirit's here for, to reveal things to us, to open our eyes and open our understanding and give us revelation of things that we have no business uh, knowing with our natural mind. In Acts 3, 17 through 26, this is kind of a lengthy scripture, but it, it, it helps us to read this. Yet now, brethren... I know that you did it in ignorance. This is Peter preaching. He's talking about them crucifying Jesus, as did also your rulers. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets, that the Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, 
So times are refreshing. You're going to come from God. Why? Because their sins are blotted out. Because all the Old Testament stuff that they went through, everything that they saw, if, if they'll get an understanding that all of that was foretelling Jesus, then they would understand that all of those sacrifices represented different parts of sin in their life that they were be, going to be getting rid of because of Jesus, that they couldn't get rid of with the sacrifice. That's good news. You don't have to keep killing the family pet. You know what I mean? Now, goes on to say, and that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, from he whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said to the fathers, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren, whom you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you. So Moses was talking about the Lord's going to raise up a prophet. Moses is talking about Jesus. We're going to go back and we're going to find out how Moses talks about Jesus. Because clearly here he is implying through the prophets and through Moses who wrote the law that they were all speaking about Jesus. So if we want a greater understanding, I mean, the New Testament is roughly a third the thickness, a uh, third the number of pages of the Old Testament. The Old Testament is chock full of detail about how to live this life and, and how we can have more revelation, more understanding of who God is. And it shall be that every soul who will not hear the prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Wow, we don't hear that preached much anymore. Um, yes, and all the prophets from Samuel and those who follow, as many as have spoken, yeah, Jesus was that prophet, wasn't he? Yes, and all the prophets from Samuel and those who follow, as many as have spoken, have also foretold these days. You are sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. In order for that to happen, in order for that to happen, Jesus has to fulfill all this. To you first, God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from your iniquities. I mean, I know this is a lengthy reciting of Peter's sermon, but we find we find him referring to the Old Testament prophets foretelling of the exact way the Christ would come, suffer, die, and be risen again to life. The entire purpose is to bring man to a place of restoration, as in the beginning of all things. Not he's he's not trying to bring man to a restoration of man uh, being under the law or man just living a good life. He is trying to bring mankind back to a place in the beginning when he, man had total freedom, when there was no sin, no knowledge of sin, no violation, no lack of faith, no sickness, disease, poverty, or despair. The Greek word for iniquity, Iniquities actually means depravity, wickedness, evil purposes. Now we find this same exact language in Genesis 6, 5, where God says about man that the intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And here, Peter, he's talking about we got to get rid of our iniquity. We got, we got to turn from our iniquity. Well, what is iniquity? It's the intent of men's hearts to only be evil continually. That's what iniquity is. And we I mean, we fall prey to that. Mankind falls prey to that, to where evil means destructive, hurtful. We fall prey to that every single day. I mean, all the stuff happening in the world today, it, it's all because of iniquity. It's because the thoughts and intents of men's hearts are always continually evil. Now, God destroyed the entirety of mankind and the earth with everything in it because of the iniquity of men, because men's hearts were always continually evil. God destroys the whole earth. It was the intent of men's hearts that brought God to that place of extinguishing everything. But then he says this, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And we find that in the New Testament, Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Noah is also a type of Christ, as we're going to see when we get into studying the ark. Jesus was a preacher of righteousness. 
actually Jesus was righteousness. When he talks about himself, he's talking about righteousness. Joseph is a type of Christ. David is a type of Christ. Moses, a type of Christ. Daniel, a type of Christ. Even in the creation, we find types and shadows of Christ in the seven days of creation. God begins the book of the account of creation this way. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, many scientists have discounted the creation story or just flatly can't claimed it's untrue. In recent times, uh, I just read this about Stephen Hawking. Uh, he admitted that uh, time and the earth had to have had a starting point, an origin. He, they, he, they held for a long time, and science held for a long time, um, science without God, that is, because there's science with God and there's science without God. Science without God held that um, everything just was always out there, and it was kind of always in existence. And it all kind of came together accidentally, and things began to pop and whiz, and next thing you know, there's the, you know, there's this thing called a, you know, uh, an earth and a thing called a sun and a thing called a moon and, and all that. Well, even Stephen Hawking said, we, we can't do that with time. We, we can't prove time was infinite. We can't prove that space is infinite. There had to be some place, some origin for it all. And he says, probably the most remarkable discovery of modern cosmology to deny the creation really is to deny the gospel. Faith is really about choices. Choices we make on what, who we believe. Genesis account of creation requires as much or as little faith, however you want to look at it, to believe in the evolutionary theory um, of existence, creation, as, as creation it takes about the same. It, it, it takes either as little faith to believe in both or as much faith to believe in both. If if you can believe without any faith at all that we crawled up out of the muck and mire of some pond, some cesspool somewhere, and all of a sudden we became a human being, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of years later, if you can believe that with all the evidence we have, that nothing is changing like that then um, you have plenty of faith to believe in God. So if the earth were once were one giant accident, then there would clearly not be able to be one giant purposeful plan. Think about that. If the earth was a giant accident, then it's not possible for there to be a giant purposeful plan. And yet written over about a 4,000-year period, we have this thing called the Old Testament and the New Testament. And all of them map out a purposeful plan for mankind. None of these people, none of the, the words that were fulfilled had any ability to fulfill themselves. Now, it would have been impossible to train a man to fulfill. There are 300 prophecies, direct prophecies about Jesus. It would have been impossible to take any man, train him, put him in all the right places, all the right circumstances, have him do all the right things, have all the people around him do all the right things to fulfill all 300 of those. It, it's impossible. In fact, I found this according to an article published in CBN. One person fulfilling eight prophecies, just one person fulfilling eight of the prophecies of, that relate to Christ would be one in... What is that? A hundred zillion, I guess. Uh, more than a million, more than a billion, more than a trillion. One person fulfilling eight prophecies is one chance in 10 to the 157th power. Yeah, there you go, quadrillion. So for, for somebody to fulfill eight of the prophecies exactly like they were written, the chance is one in a hundred quadrillion. The really incredible thing about Jesus is that he did not, he not only did he fulfill all the prophecies, but he completed each type and shadow, all the types and shadows of the Old Testament that relate to him. He, he fulfilled every single one of them. 
Nobody could have done that. There are over a thousand types and shadows, things that, that relate to Jesus in the Old Testament. There is absolutely no way that he could have done it, done that. We're going to close with this, Romans 5, 13 through 15. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeliness, transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. But the free gift is not like the offense. For if by the one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift of the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to the many. Check this verse out because it says clearly that Adam is a type of Jesus. It also says that death reigned over Adam and his seed until death could no longer reign because Jesus crushed it. And the Hebrew people, they would have been absolutely confounded to find out that the law that they held so precious actually revealed sin. It didn't get rid of it. It revealed it. That's how, how important this Old Testament is. So next week, we're going to start in the book of Genesis, and we're going to pick out a few really, really good ones. Thank you, everybody. God bless you. Have a great night. We shall see you on Sunday, everybody. And uh, pray for Miss Janet, um, her and her family. It's, it's a really tough time for them. So pray for them, and uh, we will see you next week. Blessings.